Hey guys, it's Cynthia and welcome back to my studio. At the beginning of the year, I made a promise to myself that I would start doing more sketches from my imagination for their own sake. So I resolved to sketch whatever was on my mind and record it for my video this week. I went into this not knowing whatsoever what I was going to draw, and it turns out that my mind is full of nightmare fuel, because the theme of the sketches today turned out to be bugs. And if you're not a fan of creepy crawlies, I do apologize. You might not enjoy this very much, but please don't say I didn't warn you. As with all of my time-lapse chat videos, this isn't going to be a detailed tutorial, but I will tell you what materials I'm using. We're keeping it pretty simple this week. I'm sketching in a 5.5 by 8.5 inch moleskin sketchbook, and I'm using Palomino Blackwing pencils. I just started using these absolutely gorgeous pencils, and they don't advertise how hard their lead is like a lot of art pencils do, but based on my experience, it feels like about a 5B or 6B lead, which goes down pretty dark. Now, this choice of medium is pretty convenient to me today because I had a slight mishap with some of my brushes. I went out and did a life painting session recently, and I accidentally didn't wash a few of my brushes that were still left over in my travel bag, and now they're hard as a brick. That's what happens when your bristles tangle with the Kevlar armor of oil paintings, otherwise known as liquid. I have some brush restoring soap I'm going to try before giving up on them entirely, but I'm happy to be working in pencil today either way, since pencil was my first true love. I tend to start off most of my pencil sketches pretty lightly in order to build up something of a road map for what I'd like to draw. And you might even be able to see in the recording that I tend to change the grip on my pencil a lot depending on how dark I need the line to be. Sometimes I'm even holding it way, way at the back and just sort of letting the weight of the pencil itself be the only pressure on the page when I want a really faint line. And after getting into it though, I tend to have a pretty heavy hand and I enjoy alternating between the point and the flat edge of the lead to give myself options with the line thickness. So the theme today is bugs and I'll tell you how that happened. If you're following me on Instagram, you might already know this story, but I was getting out of the shower the other day, and as I was pulling down the bath towel from off the rack to put it around my head to dry my hair, a spider fell out of it. And that ended up being the inspiration for this sketch of a character with a headdress that sort of resembles a bath towel and some kind of spider decoration on her face. If you sometimes get blank page paralysis, which is that feeling where you sit down with your sketchbook to draw something and just don't know where to start, or if you're like me and drawing from your imagination on the spot doesn't quite come as naturally as doing thumbnails with a larger concept in mind, one thing you can do is to try to leave yourself open to random inspiration like this from your day-to-day -day life and then try interpreting that into a scene or a character of some kind. You know, most of my imaginative drawing in the past few years was actually done at shows or conventions, usually on like the blank backs of magic cards or other small collectibles for fans. And sometimes they come up to you with a specific thing in mind that they want you to draw, but I'd say about 80% of the time they actually don't. You know, when I was doing shows on the regular, I always used to ask beforehand if there's something particular they'd like me to draw, or is it artist's choice? So every time it was left up to me, I would do a unique sketch, but all of my sketches usually relied pretty heavily on the subjects that I was most comfortable with in order to be able to do like up to a hundred sketches back to back very quickly on the fly. And typically they started with a woman's face, and then I added some kind of unique costume treatment or pointed ears or flowing hair or some kind of interesting shapes on top of that basic template. And as I was sketching this, I was thinking about that, that the reason that that was the most comfortable subject for me is that I spent most of my formative years drawing and painting young women, because I was one. And when you grow up as an only child learning art, especially if you grew up before there was endless reference available on the internet, you end up doing a lot of drawing practice in the mirror rather than getting practice with a diverse array of people. So even still to this day, I feel the effects of that. And my first instinct when drawing the spider character was to make it a young woman. 
After I posted the sketch of the spider character and the story behind it on Instagram, my coworkers saw it and it got them to talking about terrifying bug stories. And one of the other art directors gave an incredibly detailed account of a time that he had a wasp infestation at his house. And he followed that up with a recounting of an article he read about this poor guy who fell into a wasp nest. And I don't know about you, but I find wasps and hornets and basically anything that can fly and sting you way more terrifying than spiders. I absolutely cannot stand wasps. So I think my brain just wanted to get something wasp related onto paper so it wouldn't be in my brain anymore and I wouldn't have to think about it. So after warming up with Spider Lady, I decided that whatever I did for this sketch wasn't going to rely on my go-to formula, because we're all creatures of habit and we grow when we challenge our biases. And again, being open to random inspiration from that conversation with my coworkers about wasps made it easier to sit down and just begin drawing, instead of staring at a blank page feeling lost, even though I'm not quite as comfortable drawing a man's face from memory. When drawing from imagination, it's also a good idea to let go of the pressure to make it perfect or exactly lifelike. In the past, I know that I've hesitated to draw something from my head because I'm fearful that my doodling will look a lot less professional than a well-planned, well-referenced drawing. And when we're not using reference, it's normal for some proportions to be a bit wonky or lighting to be more formulaic rather than realistic. But if your goal is to get an idea onto paper or get the image of wasps out of your mind, just do that and don't worry so much about the technical execution. So my question for you guys today is, what's the thing that you're the most comfortable sketching out of your head? Give that some thought and leave me a comment down in the comments section and then think about what challenges you. And maybe listen for some interesting random stuff this coming week that might make you inspired to draw that thing. Keeping with our theme, the third sketch was kind of a stream of consciousness riff off of the wasp drawing. I used some of the wing shapes that I had been doodling to make part of the costuming on another made up character. As this sketch is time-lapsing, I've picked out another question from your comments on my previous videos to answer today in a little short Q&A session. On my Learning from Failure video, Greenwood says, I was never as disheartened by failure as I was by receiving criticism that came like whiplash. Especially when the criticism is coming from those who are ignorant about the subject and think they have the right to tear you down. Constructive feedback is definitely helpful, but it needs to come from those who actually know the stuff. How do you deal with that? So there are a couple parts to this question, and I want to start off by respectfully disagreeing with the fact that people who aren't skilled artists can't give good critique. Because people who don't make art can absolutely have opinions about your work, and sometimes they do have useful observations. Some of their input on technique might not be correct, but their reactions to your work can actually be really useful data for you because non-artists are a huge part of your audience. Like we don't get the luxury of only creating for other creators. And sometimes their feedback can be harder to interpret because it's usually more nebulous or they don't really have the vocabulary to express what they mean. Like non-artists typically make statements like, I don't get it, or something looks off, but they can't really articulate why. Now there are a lot of people out there who do understand art pretty deeply, even if they don't practice it. That's the case with some art historians, even some art directors are in that position. And, you know, think about if your friends have ever written a critical opinion of a movie on social media, or if you've ever read a really poignant and observant critical movie review by a professional columnist, like how many of those people, including your friends, do you think have ever directed or actively participated in the creation of a feature film? Probably not a lot, right? And it doesn't necessarily mean that they're wrong or that their observations are invalid. So that's an interesting way to kind of frame it in your mind the next time you get critique from someone who's not an artist themselves. Now, I can certainly agree that unsolicited critique or harsh criticism is never fun to deal with, especially when it catches you off guard because you're just not prepared to hear it. 
Um, and when people are forceful with their opinions, it's hard to separate the point of what they're saying from their tone. In art critique, we often talk about content versus execution. As in, are you judging against the message of the art or the techniques the artist used to create it? And some folks are just trolls who disrespect you or attack you as a person, and those can just be dismissed outright. They're either just trying to get a rise out of you or they feel the need to be mean-spirited out of their own failing. <laughs> like trying to cut someone else down because it's the only way they can feel good when they don't have anything real to offer the world. So it's best to just ignore those comments and move on. And you can arm yourself with the knowledge that other sensible people will read those comments for exactly what they are. And then there are others who are genuinely trying to help, but they're either aggressive or impatient, or maybe they're just bad at framing their opinions in a positive sounding way. And if that's the case, do try to separate the content from the execution. See if there's any value in their message before disregarding their critique completely on the basis of its tone. I've heard a lot of folks say, you know, don't take criticism personally, but I've never actually found that statement very helpful on its own. So I would add that it's important to practice not reacting in the moment. I think that's the more practical version of that statement because we're human and we have an emotional connection to our work. So sometimes hearing harsh critique is like someone telling you your child is ugly and no one wants to hear that. So sometimes we need to take time to separate ourselves from the comment and think about it so that we can differentiate harsh but useful criticism from nonsense. And not reacting in the moment means not typing up a defensive response to a rude comment or arguing with someone who's giving you an in-person critique. Just try to listen and observe and remember that ultimately we as the creators get to choose what critical information we dismiss or what we accept and grow from. So thanks for watching guys. It is Sunday and it's getting pretty late. So I'm gonna go grab a cup of coffee and I'm gonna get this video edited and posted as quickly as possible. And hopefully I will see you guys next time. Bye-bye.